Shalom Lekulam. Welcome to Jerusalem on this beautiful spring day. I mean, really, could the weather get any better? It's been amazing. We're finally starting to see a break in the rainy season, which means that we're going to start going on a lot more fun adventures together. If you're new here, I am Callie Mitchell, and this is my channel, I Will Not Keep Silent. The last few weeks, I was hitting the holidays pretty hard between Purim and Resurrection Sunday. So I thought maybe it would be good to segue back into more geopolitical and theological issues related to Israel by asking my audience what questions you all had with Israel right now and just doing a general Q&A show so we could hit on a lot of big topics in one video. And answering the questions also gives me an opportunity to explain to you guys a little bit more about what my vision is for my channel as it grows too. So let's just jump right in and see what you all were curious about. Okay, from Facebook, we had this question. The news on Fox is telling about protesters at the prime minister's residence. Are you, any, are you in any danger relating to this? No, we're completely safe and fine. The protest did walk past our house, but it was completely safe and peaceful. The people who are protesting right now are standing with the families of the hostages that are currently in Gaza. Uh, I understand that the media was portraying it as a violent event. I'm not really sure what the goal of doing that was. I've, I had friends who were there and they said it was nonviolent and it was a great event. So. It was completely fine and we're we're completely safe and protests are an important part of israeli democracy because we don't have representatives the way that the american system has so in order for people to really voice their opinion on an issue they tend to protest regularly so i support this as part of our democratic process and then we had another one callie how far is this war from where you live in jerusalem in miles Gaza is 49 miles from Jerusalem if you're to draw a straight line. If you're to drive in a car, it's about 130 miles. So if that gives you an idea of our proximity and our distance, <laughs> um, it would take us maybe two hours to drive there. And I think uh, the IDF has done an incredible job at keeping everything contained to that location because we have been very safe and it's been very calm in Jerusalem. I also had this comment that was more of a request for some resources. Uh, my friend here, she says, I wish I knew better where to find honest rebuttals to the pro Gazan post I see all the time that claim the IDF has done X atrocity. I know it's propaganda and I absolutely appreciate that Israel accurately follows up on the accusations before confirming or denying it. I just love to be able to find that info. Yeah, okay, this is a great question for a number of reasons. For one, I, I'm just gonna take a minute to use it to share why I do what I do here at I Will Not Keep Silent. As a busy mom of four, I can't do breaking news. I'm also not trained as a journalist. I have a master's degree in architecture and I have a certificate in apologetics. So my channel, I would more consider to be apologetics than breaking news, which means I'm gonna help you have a big picture understanding of what's happening in Israel, both theologically and geopolitically with hopefully a lot of substance and information to help you be a better critical thinker and to have a biblical worldview that includes the restoration of Israel. I generally assume that you all can't keep up with every detail either. So really, I hope to provide you with a framework so that you can give general responses when you do see Palestinian propaganda pop up that you know isn't true. Uh, in terms of resources to go to, I think what my friend here is really looking for would be the watchdog organizations like Palestinian Media Watch, Memory, which is the Middle East Research Institute, NGO Monitor. These are organizations that follow both Palestinian media and nonprofit organizations that support the Palestinian cause and they report accurately and factually on them. So I think these are great places to go to get really well cited information about what is taking place here because they often will correct things that they see that are misrepresented in the media. You can also follow the IDF on X. They are really good about releasing information all throughout the day and there's some other people on X that I follow too like Dr. 
Eli David. In English, you would say Eli, but Eli David. <laughs> I think he does great content there on X. Of course, I, X is not my favorite place. It tends to be very loud. I also follow uh, Jerusalem Jane. I follow Amir Sarfati. Um, I follow Hanaya Naftali. I, I try to follow a lot of different people, so I get different um, different perspectives and angles on what's happening, both believers and non-believers, secular or religious. Jews. Avi Abelo is another one that I would recommend. I will make sure to include all of these links. Also, for a really strong journalistic perspective that seeks to remain bias-free so you can draw your own conclusions, I recommend The Inside Scoop with Nick Jan, Nicole John Sezian. She's actually a very good friend of mine. Her husband is Armenian, they're Israelis, and her biggest strength is that she is a professional journalist and she really does just provide factual information. And she also does really excellent human interest pieces. I think that is really her gifting. But she is definitely someone, she's a good friend of mine, but she's also someone that I would consider a mentor in certain respects because even if I do work in apologetics, sometimes that does veer into journalism and I often need some professional help and so Nicole is who I go to for questions and one of the things that she has taught me is that accurate news is better than fast news, right? And I really appreciate her wisdom on that. So with that in mind, my friend did point out that Israel will often come in and clarify information with time and I think it's perfectly fine when you see pro-Palestinian propaganda to just give it a little bit of time and wait for the truth to come out just as what happened with the hospital bombing back in October when it just took a matter of days for, for the government here in Israel to start releasing the recordings of Hamas discussing it being a Palestinian Islamic Jihad rocket and for imagery to come out and videos to come out or just a few weeks ago someone accused an IDF soldier of raping someone at Shifa Hospital and within a matter of days she confessed that she completely fabricated that story and it was completely removed from the Al Jazeera website. There wasn't even a hint of truth to that story. It was 100% made up. You know, sometimes it is okay just to wait and give it some time. Also, I think it helps to remember that the IDF doesn't target civilians and the IDF does abide by international law and also that when a soldier does step out of orders, and step out of protocol, there are consequences for that, right? So sometimes it helps if you could just remind people of this, like if they post something accusing an IDF soldier of rape or whatever, say, well, this is not IDF policy, and I think we just need to wait and see what comes out in the next few days. You know, you can say that just to kind of put a placeholder in it and then wait for the information to arrive in the next few days. But it's perfectly fine to wait and see what happens. And also make sure to follow All Israel News where I contribute a monthly op-ed because they do uphold journalistic standards and they write from a biblical worldview as well. Okay, another one. President Netanyahu surely won't take advice warnings from Joe Biden, right? I hope not. <laughs> okay, so we might, I actually had a few questions about this, so we might need to do a whole video on what's going on with Biden as it relates to Israel. And I will just say that the only thing that we're really asking for here in Israel is that you all would continue to provide military support in terms of financing weapons and also that you all would continue to veto any anti-Israel resolutions that come up at the UN. That's the main thing that we want here. And Biden has been pulling away from Israel and putting us in a difficult position, but we are a sovereign nation and I think Bibi being drawn into Biden's positions will just depend on how much he believes is at stake, what kind of support we could lose from our greatest ally in the world, the United States of America. So please do continue to write your representatives and let them know that you want them to stand with Israel and you want them to hold the president accountable to the people on this issue. So continue to do that and we may do a more thorough video on this in the future. Another one I had a few people write me about privately is what I thought about the eclipse that's coming up on April 8th. And you all, I'll just say I went to go study it because I had people ask me my thoughts on it and 
I sat down to do some reading and then I also opened up a video that I was going to watch and I just couldn't sit and get into it. I think because my calling in this season right now is really to stand with Israel and to give you all education on what's taking place here in Israel. And that's just not where the Lord wanted me to invest my time. I think this is an American issue. I will say that two things I noticed though is that I ran into one article that was using a lot of prophetic imagery related to the patterns forming an X and interpreting this. And then I had another article that was talking about how the pattern formed an Aleph. All of these things are very subjective and interpretive and I don't know, like can both be right? I mean, maybe a little bit right, but is it an X or is it an Aleph? You know what I'm saying? So I would just say be a critical thinker about it. Protect your eyes, protect your children's eyes, your pet's eyes, and don't be in such a panic about any of these things that you see happening that you can't walk out what your daily calling is in the Lord, right? I guess my greatest message to you all will always be just continue to get in the Word, put on your worship music, have your oil flask full so that when things do happen, you are ready. You don't, you don't have to be so preoccupied about the eclipse or whatnot. Just, just stay in the Word of God and be ready. You know, that's it. And keep your eyes safe and keep doing your laundry because we're in a war here. And y'all, I do so much laundry and I do so, so many loads of dishes. <laughs> you know, like life doesn't stop is what I'm trying to say. Life doesn't stop because these things are happening. Keep being faithful in the everyday calling that the Lord has on you, right? Just keep on. Okay, what's next? All right, tourism. That's another one. I had a lot of questions about tourism. Okay, by a lot, I mean two. <laughs> All right, I had this one here from one friend. She says, I'm curious if and how tourism will be affected. I would love to visit and was hoping to this year, but don't know if it's something that won't happen now and then i had another friend post a similar question on youtube she said i've heard that people are still visiting israel how is tourism being handled at this time is it still safe to plan a trip all right yes come um it's not going to be the same though because what's happening right now is that the tours that are being offered actually are offering both adv advocacy experiences and service experiences here in Israel. So rather than being the standard pilgrim tours where you're just going nonstop from sunrise to sunset looking at pilgrim tours, you're actually getting an opportunity to interact with Israelis a lot more. And I think this is fantastic and would be an incredible opportunity. Tourism is also really great for our economy, so it is really important that people continue to come. Now, I will tell you the two things that you risk. The first one is the possibility that your tour could get canceled because we are in a situation where we just don't know from day to day how things are going to change. Um, just yesterday, you know, the day before I was recording this, there was a lot of talk about a possible attack from Iran. Now, I'm looking at this through a biblical lens and going, this isn't the time for Gog and Magog. We will deal with Iran in a time of peace, right? We'll be in a time of peace when there's an attack from Iran. So yes, they could technically attack, but I was not concerned that it was going to erupt into a war, a greater, more regional war, right? Um, but Hezbollah could heat up, you know, we just don't know from day to day how things are moving forward. But your tour guide and your tour company, they liaison with the government and they are provided information and they would let you know at what point you would need to cancel and reschedule. So that is one risk. The other risk is that you get here and maybe there's some sirens and you might have to run and take cover. So you need to know where you are personally and where your family is and whether or not this would be a traumatic incident if it was something that you were to experience when you got here, right? But the tours do take you to safe areas and it's generally a really positive experience for people who come. I actually just connected with a pastor from the town next to my hometown, Pastor Brian Rogers, and he was here on a tour with Christians United for Israel. They organized an effort to bring pastors over so that they could 
see what was actually happening on the ground, and then they could take their experience back to the American church and give people firsthand information, which I thought was just fantastic. I loved watching his videos while he was here. I'm gonna link his YouTube channel. Where, where do I link it? Do I link it here? Do I link it here maybe? Um, or is it here? I think it's here, but I'm gonna link his channel so that you all can watch the videos that he made while he was on tour. I think that would help you make an informed decision on whether or not this was a season that you wanted to come or if you wanted to wait until it was more peaceful and you wanted to do a, a more standard pilgrim tour. But I also polled my friends and I found out about three amazing tour opportunities that are coming up in the future that I, the spring and the summer that I wanted to share with you all because I think they're really, really great opportunities. Okay, so the first one is offered by FIRM, which is a ministry here in Jerusalem out of the Messianic community, and it stands for Fellowship of Israel-Related Ministries. So if you have an Israel-related ministry, you might want to connect with them. But also, they have a tour coming up called the Jerusalem Encounter Tour, and it is May 29th through June 8th, 2024. And this one is one that will combine pilgrim advocacy and some service projects. So I think this could be an excellent fit for some of you. Okay, this is another one that seems really amazing and incredible, SAR-L. They are trying to bring volunteers over to Israel to work alongside the IDF in non-combatant civilian support capacity. So what's really cool about this is that you come, you stay on an IDF base, you're given IDF clothes, and you serve alongside them doing things like repair work on the base, packing medical equipment, cleaning, mechanical work, um, whatever your background might lend towards. You get to do that, you get to sleep in the barracks, and then on the weekends they provide more pilgrim type tours and cultural experiences to make your trip worthwhile. So I think that's an amazing opportunity. I mean, how many people in the world would get to say, I stayed on IDF base and help support the IDF during a time of war. I think that's incredible and I would love to see some of you all do that. And another one, and this one is really close to my heart because my very close friend Becca is in charge of this effort. Bridges for Peace, which is an evangelical Christian ministry here in Israel that works to facilitate relationship building between evangelicals and the Jewish community. They are offering through their Zealous Youth Program a youth tour for ages 18 to 30 in July. So it will run from July 21st until August 1st. So if you are a young adult or if you have a young adult, this would be a great opportunity. Again, they are also doing pilgrim advocacy and service projects. Okay, I had to change locations because the sun was moving. That is one of the downsides of doing this outside is that I am running from the sun the whole time. Also, while I'm here, I did want to say that if you're interested in sewing into my channel or our family, I do have our PayPal information linked both in my bio and I will put it in the show notes here. I am trying to raise some funds so that I can buy some better equipment so we can have better adventures in different fun sites in the city. And I'm about halfway to what I need to buy a good wireless mic set. And if you're interested in contributing to that, please check my bio for my PayPal information. Of course, we live on one Israeli income and we do not itinerate for support. We only ask occasionally when we have needs. A few years ago, our community got together and helped fly my mom over to support me during a major surgery that I, that I needed to have. And we do try to do the best we can to live independently, but um, this is kind of a new thing for me on YouTube, and I would just be really blessed if you would be interested in sewing in. Okay, so back to our questions. The next really big one that came up was the red heifers. I had one person who was like, two questions, red heifers. And then I had two other people continue to comment, yes, what's going on with the red heifers? So that seemed to be one of the issues that you all were most interested in an update on. So what is going on with the heifers? Well, the ceremony has not happened yet. So it does look like, based on the statements from the Temple Mount rabbis, that the ceremony could be any time between Passover and Shavuot. Again, this is something that I'm repeating from the organization that owns the cows, all right? That's where this information is coming from. 
I know there has been another Messianic leader with a big platform saying that it's not going to happen and this and that. I'm telling you what the organization that owns the cows is saying, and you can do with that what you will, okay? <laughs> but this isn't just, I'm just saying this isn't just gossip in the community. Like, this is what the owners of the cows are saying, okay? Now, in the past, what was going on is that the government was supportive of them doing the ceremony and was going to provide security and the, the Christian ministry that helped facilitate getting the cows over was going to live stream the ceremony for anyone in the world to watch. But with the world, with the war going on, this has all been strongly discouraged. So I'm guessing what will happen is that at whatever point the ceremony takes place, it will probably happen quietly and then information about it will be released later. That's my assumption about what's happening. The altar that you saw in the CBS video was not the altar that was built for the ceremony. That one is a replica in the Dead Sea area. I was glad to have found that out because when I was watching that particular video, I knew that that was not the right location. That was not the Mount of Olives, right? <laughs> so um, I knew that was not correct. So right now we're just all waiting to see what happens. And I have heard from an Arab Christian friend that they have been in discussion about it in East Jerusalem as well. And they have a little bit of anxiety. I don't know to what extent, but you know, there was just an expression that there was some anxiety about what what could happen if the ceremony does take place. So it does need a lot of prayer. Just continue to lift it to the Lord and that, um, you know, uh, whatever his most perfect will in this regarding this will be done, okay? The other big news that the Temple Institute has released is that they do have a Cohen, which is a priest, who meets all the qualifications to perform the ceremony if he's interested. He's a young guy and he has not been in contact with any dead body, which is one of the one of the criteria. So many of you might not be aware of this, but the religious Jewish community has actually been really diligent in keeping records on the Kohanim, the priest, and many of them can actually trace their ancestry back to Aaron because they have had this anticipation that at some point in the future they would return to Israel and they would rebuild their temple and they would re-enter into the more biblical Judaic practices of temple worship from, from the Torah, from the Le Levitical law. So they have kept really good records of this so that they could be ready for that at some point in the future. And so this young man, he is from that lineage and he was born at home. So he does not, he did not come in contact with any dead bodies. They can't go to a cemetery and if they're born in a hospital, there's a possibility that they could come in contact with a dead body at the hospital. So many of the religious ladies opt to have home births. I actually had three home births, so it was fun to follow the home birth community all being like, home birth for the win! <laughs> so that was really fun. But yeah, things are actually moving in an interesting direction and we are going to cover this in two different videos in the future. I'm going to talk about what plans are in place to build a third temple and what that looks like. And of course, I'm going to be discussing this from a facts on the ground perspective. Like no matter what you think about this theologically, this is actually what's happening. You understand what I'm saying? Like there's a difference between analyzing it theologically and having a theological opinion on it versus accepting and understanding that people are moving in this direction. So we're going to do one video where we talk about the steps that are being taken to move in that direction. And then after that, we're going to do another video on should Christians support a third temple? Because that is one of the biggest questions that I've gotten from all of you and it's going to take its own video to kind of work through. My goal for that one is to present a few different arguments so that you can decide for yourself what your conviction will be. I'm not gonna tell you what to think, okay? So make sure to like and subscribe so you're ready for when those drop. Another great question I had is, I would love to know how the southern kibbutzim are doing. Are they planting crops, raising animals, or just empty and windblown? Okay, so the southern kibbutzim are actually starting to come back to life in a sense. The people have started to return according to when the government has said that it is safe for them to go back. At our peak, we had over 500,000 Israelis that were internally displaced, both from the south and from our northern border. 
And my understanding is that right now we still have 94,000, 95,000 that are internally displaced. So and back in February, I read a really sweet argument about kibbutz Shlomit, and they were discussing how they were finally permitted to go back to their homes. And it was something that part of them wanted to celebrate, but they couldn't fully celebrate it because of understanding what they were entering back into and knowing that their whole community wouldn't be joining them. So it has been a bittersweet effort. But throughout this entire process, the farms have continued to be kept up through the support of Israelis throughout the country, going down and volunteering time. And also different groups have come from abroad to work on the farms, some from Asia, some volunteer groups from the United States. Some of the tours that I spoke about earlier, some of the um, service projects that they do re re involved going and working on some harvest. So people have done a great job at keeping the farms going in the South. So do continue to pray for the people as they return home and that they would be able to return home very quickly if they are not there yet. And that leads us to our last question. This friend, she says, how are the people and children especially healing mentally? Are there special groups assigned long-term that are helping to heal these people who have been through such unbelievable trauma mentally and spiritually? I am spending a lot of time researching the long-term effects for everyone there in the Holy Land, and there really is nothing to compare the experience to on such a large scale like our 9-11 here in the U.S. Yeah, that's a really great observation, and that's some discussions that the mental health and counseling organizations and care providers have been discussing here, too, that they don't really have a model for addressing what has taken place in this nation at the scale that it took place on. In fact, they have expressed that they don't have enough facilities and licensed counselors to do individual counseling for everyone who has been involved. Basically, everyone in Israel has some, some level of trauma. Most of it is low-level trauma, but that could increase according to how close in proximity someone was to the events that happened on October 7th, whether they were actually there or someone, one of their loved ones was there. Everyone here is in, in a state of needing some repair. The good news though is that this, this culture is extremely resilient by nature. Israelis are some of the most resilient people I've ever seen and we have been encouraged to get back to normal life as much as possible and I do think that something about that has been helpful because I feel that when our hands are busy it helps to um, take our focus off of some of the really evil and traumatic things that have happened and to be more forward looking, right? But it, it also has been exhausting because we are a culture of people who has been trying to do work and laundry and take care of kids and, you know, all of our normal responsibilities with this war in the background and with loved ones in Gaza or on the northern border. So I can just tell you a little bit about me, my experience with the trauma. I mean, mine has been real low level, but back in January, our neighbors left in the middle of the night to go to the airport and I wasn't aware that they were leaving. So my dog got up and started barking because there was activity in the hall and that's not normal for her to get up in the middle of the night and bark. And so I woke up completely startled. And of course, because of October 7th, my mind just went to the worst case scenario, like, oh no, are there monsters in our house? And then I had such a adrenaline rush from it that I couldn't go back to sleep the rest of the night, right? So that to me was indication that I was still dealing with some processing of what happened, even as someone who wasn't there, just someone who lives in Israel. And I know that there are terrorists in Jerusalem. You can watch my video on my testimony from 2015 where I talk about that. But, you know, just knowing that there are terrorists in Israel and that being where my mind went right away, it just means that I maybe have some things that I need to continue to lay down to the Lord and allow him to heal in me, right? So this is what we're all facing on various levels. Even the first two weeks after what happened, on October 7th, it was really hard to eat. I mean, I was eating, but nothing really tastes right, you know? <laughs> you know, so this is something that we've all been processing and working through together. And the care providers for mental health have been trying to approach this 
in more group dynamics, like more group counseling and art therapy and things where people are engaging together rather than individually. For our mom's group, we had a Christian organization meet with us online and give us some practical steps we could take for addressing trauma and fear in our children. That was extremely helpful. So there's a lot of different ways that this is being addressed. And there's also a lot of questions about it because, because it did happen at such a large scale and to so many people in the population that they don't have the resources, of course, to, to do individual counseling, as I've said, but they also don't know what this is going to look like long term. I'm very hopeful and optimistic, though, because I do see this resilience in this culture. And there have been some conversations, too, though, about how the resilience in the Israeli people is something that people with anti-Semitic intentions use to cast Israelis as the oppressor within the Marxist oppressed and oppressor paradigm without understanding that this is something um, that the Israelis embrace because they want to be successful. They want the next generation to succeed. They believe in tikkun olam, which is the restoration of all things. This is like what we would call in Christianity the creation mandate from Genesis. So they believe in continuing to work in a positive direction until the Messiah arrives, right? Which we believe will be his second coming. So um, there is a, a biblical worldview that does motivate this resilience that's within them. And I think even in a spiritual way, you know, we look at Ezekiel 37 and we see that the Lord breathe life into the dry dead bones right and he says in the word this is the house of israel so we see this time and time again of the lord breathing life into these bones and a lot of people don't really know what to do with this but it's the lord you guys so i'm recording this one day before we are exactly six months past october 7th and people are still hurting we still have hostages in gaza that is not lost on the population we're very aware so it does need a lot of prayer and that is your job, you all. Those of you throughout the world, the Gentile believers, throughout the nations, your, your calling is to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. And I would just encourage you to continue to pray for this nation and um, see what the Lord does. You know, we, we know in Zechariah 12 through 14 that Jerusalem, all the nations will gather against Jerusalem. And in that day, the inhabitants of Jerusalem will be as David will be as the house of David, the word, the word of the Lord says. And I really think that part of that is because of the prayers of the saints. So you all, please do continue to intercede for Israel. Thank you so much for being here. I hope this was a fun video for you all. It was fun for me just to cover a, a variety of, of subjects. And make sure to like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell. I have a few really fun videos coming up in the near future. So I will see you next time.